This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Walter Smith Randolph. We're only a day away from recreational marijuana sales in Connecticut. So what will that look like across the state? In this segment, we're talking to Jeffrey Marrero, a cannabis consultant based in Stamford. We also have Skylar Frazier, who has been covering all things cannabis for the Hartford Business Journal. And you'll hear from Benjamin Zachs, the chief operating officer of Fine Fettle, which has dispensaries in Connecticut and Massachusetts. Let's start with Skylar. Good morning, Skylar. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Of course. Recreational cannabis st- sales start tomorrow. So what is that going to look like? Yeah, so we have nine dispensaries that have been approved to begin hybrid sales beginning tomorrow on January 10th. So nine are going to be allowed to start serving both medical customers that they've been doing and then the adult use recreational market that's now launching. Um, now, that doesn't mean that all nine are going to be open tomorrow. Um, you know, a few could maybe delay that opening based on however they feel internally. But yeah, there's going to be nine that are authorized to begin sales to the adult use market for everyone in the state that's, you know, above 18. Okay. And what have retailers had to do to prepare for opening? So the retailers right now are all medical use. So we have 18 medical dispensaries in the state. And really what they've been doing over the past several months is converting their facilities to be able to serve both the existing medical market and now the adult use market. So I know a lot of dispensaries have really just been trying to make sure that they can serve medical customers the same quality that they've been doing over the last several years, um, while also serving the adult use. You know, I I think a big concern with some places was, hey, we don't want to just neglect these medical customers that have been with us for so many years because adult use is now open. So really, it's ensuring that they can serve, you know, what's going to be, I imagine, a lot of customers initially since, you know, there's a limited amount of facilities to go. Right. And so you mentioned the medical program. Medical program in Connecticut has been around for, for a little bit. Um, how are these social equity applicants? Are they going to be able to compete with these medical facilities who have been around for a bit? Yeah. So I think on the retail end, there's a, a, a quicker pathway to opening on the retail end. So, you know, I've already talked to some social equity applicants that are hoping that are hoping to open this first quarter of 2023. So, you know, the head start on the retail end isn't necessarily as huge, um, I would say, because, you know, companies have really been preparing this over the last year. So as long as they can, you know, figure out their supply chain and figure out what the facility is going to look like, we're going to start seeing social equity applicants come online. Um, I would imagine over the next few months. So retail side, I think, um, you know, they're not the first to the table, but they'll they'll be pretty close behind. OK. And let's talk a little bit about the lottery. How did that unfold? Uh, what went wrong? Um, how do you think it might change in the future? Yeah. So uh, the state announced back in the end of December that, you know, lottery round one is completely done, which means that all 56 companies selected in that round of lottery um are moving on towards the provisional licensing process. So, um, yeah, the state completed it in 2022, which I know that was a goal. Um, you ask about criticisms. I think one of the things we've heard both from, you know, members of the social equity council and stakeholders in the state is just, um, the unlimited number of applications that entities could submit in the lottery. Um, I know some people didn't feel great about that, about the prospects of, you know, companies being able to essentially, pump thousands of dollars into the lottery and, and get a thing and, and get a license. So um, that's one of the criticisms I've heard a lot. And, you know, we'll have to just see because um, it's all tied to the legislature. So, so the council and members of the public can advocate for changes, as, you know, only to a certain step before changes need to actually come via the law. So I think that's going to be one thing that maybe they look at for the next lottery round. I, I don't know what way that'll swing, but just things that I've heard internally, um, that that's one that I imagine there might be some discussion about next year or this year, I should say. And let's talk a little bit more about this lottery. So from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, so you could apply, but you could apply as many times as you wanted, as long as you had the money to apply. Is that right? Yeah. So there was uh, applicant fees for certain licensing types. Um, I think it might have been $500 for retail businesses. Um, and you could enter as many times you just have to pay every single time. So a lot of that was, um, a lot of that was kind of dependent on how much money people had, you know, a a social equity applicant, you need to come under a certain income threshold. So the idea that, 
you'd have to maybe partner with some financial backer to submit a lot of applications. Um, that I, I think was a concern for some, you know, there was a lot of people that submitted just one application um, thinking that they would maybe be selected when if you look at the numbers, you know, there was, I think more than 30,000 uh, app- applications submitted across all the different licensing um, models. So yeah, there was a lot of applications for not a lot of licenses this first round and, um, yes, you are accurate in, in saying that you can submit as many as you wanted as long as you have the money. That's the strategy I take with scratch offs too. So, but I don't mind. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when is the next lottery going to be? Um, DCP has not announced a date for that yet, but we've been told that um, you know there's discussions right now about that, and I imagine we'll know within the next few months on the next lottery. The initial goal, if I'm correct, was to have the second lottery, you know, at the end of the summer last year as well. But, you know, things take time. The licensing process wasn't wasn't as easy as, you know, everyone wants it to be. So I think we're going to have probably some news about that lottery, you know, within the next few months. But they are planning one for this year as well. So I imagine that'll be just, you know, monitoring and watching the market and seeing how many licenses are needed in this next round without, you know, completely flooding the, uh, the new industry. You know, our neighbor to the north, Massachusetts, um, has been doing this for a while. Do you think Connecticut's learned anything from Massachusetts or if there's anything that maybe, you know, Massachusetts did that Connecticut's like, oh, we're not going to do that. We're going to do it better. Yeah, I mean, I, I think all states have tried to have certain social equity components of the law and I just, and this is just anecdotal from what I've heard from people, you know, here in Connecticut and over in Mass, but I think Connecticut is definitely online to have the first social equity applicant um, open up a shop pretty soon after opening, which was not the case in Massachusetts. It took Mass a little bit longer to, you know, have social equity applicants up and running. So that is something that I, I think we're going to see early in Connecticut is some of these social equity applicants, um, come online sooner than in other places. It definitely, while the effort's been, I would say almost everywhere that legalization has happened, it hasn't all necessarily worked out that way very quickly. So um, I think the social equity component will be interesting to watch going forward, but I don't know, just from social equity applicants that I've talked to, they seem pretty confident that they're going to come online, um, you know, early in this first year of sales, which would be pretty different from other states in our area. And what do you need to do to qualify to be a social equity applicant just to fall under that income level? Is that right? Yeah. So it's an income level. And then there's also other pathways. Um, There's what's called the disproportionately impacted area cultivator license. And that is um, essentially you're coming from a census tract that is in an area where um, people are arrested you know, through the war on drugs more than in other areas. So um, it's really location location and income are are big factors there's also the factors if you have you know a past marijuana offense um, or cannabis offense there are other qualifiers but um yeah income and residency are really the really the two big ones i would say and and my last question on this thirty-seven thousand applications that's the number you said thirty-seven thousand. there was more than 30 uh, 30, 37,000 sounds good i haven't looked at it it recently but i know there's more than 30 yep but how First of all, how many thirty seven thousand applications for how many spots? And also, do we know how many applicants submitted multiple applications? Yeah, so th- those were all for the fifty six spots wow. of of legalization. Yeah. So those were all for fifty six. And um us at the HBJ, we did a report, um, I, I wanna say it was back in September or October, it was after one of our expos where um we got some of the data and just kind of put that out there of hey, here's what the winners, here's what the winners were. Um, and here's how many they submitted. So I know the just going off the top, like one company submitted more than 2000 licenses, and they want a social equity retailer license. Mm. Another submitted, you know, there, there was three actually that submitted more than 2000 applications each that ended up winning social equity retailer license. So just take out those three, and you have 6000 applications between them, you know, so that's, you know, make of it what you will. But I think that's where when people saw those numbers, I think even some of the legislators were like, yeah, that's ne- not necessarily our intention with with the process. And did you say somebody applied 2000 times? Yeah. Yeah. Three companies did as far as I know. Yep. Wow. So 2000 times you said 500. I took math three times. 
in college. So, you know, I can't do the math off the top of my head, but that's that's a lot of money for something that's supposed to be social equity. Wow. Uh, absolutely. We're, we're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for sure. Yeah. And um, part of the benefit of submitting more, especially in the social equity um, licensing process for the lottery is all the unpicked applications in social equity lottery go into the general lottery. So if mm. you submit 2000 in that one, you could still win a general lottery too from the 1999 you know, wow. in, in theory. So I think we'll see some changes coming soon. Uh, stick around. We have some more questions for you, but let's turn to uh, Benjamin now, who is the chief operating officer of Fine Fettle. Um, Benjamin, what are you expecting on the 10th, a big turnout? Yeah, we're really excited. We've got three locations across the state in Willimantic, Newington, and Stamford. And this is a product that people really enjoy. Um, people are using it for health and wellness benefits and currently probably driving to Massachusetts or driving to Rhode Island. And so we expect uh, a lot of excitement. It's also a lot of change of history and destigmatization and uh, passion around a plant that has been you know, demonized and vilified in a lot of ways for a hundred some odd years in our country. Um, and so this is more than just a retail store opening. This is a, this is a societal change that I think people want to see and be a part of. So we do expect it to be busy, but um, we've been preparing for 18 months to make it so it's as efficiently run as possible in our, in our locations. Right. And I also understand that you operate in Massachusetts as well. Is that right? Correct. We operate an outdoor cultivation facility and a dispensary on the mainland of Massachusetts. And I call it the mainland because we also operate a uh, cultivation facility and a dispensary on Martha's Vineyard. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, and so, uh, when you compare Massachusetts to Connecticut, uh, what's the differences? What have you seen? So, Massachusetts has become a quickly saturated, uh, arguably oversaturated state. There's already about 225 dispensaries open. There's a hundred some odd cultivators and they've been doing it for a long time and it's a different structure in the licensing process in Massachusetts versus Connecticut. Um, Massachusetts has, I'd say, liberalized a little bit in terms of product variety as well as brand and packaging. So Connecticut, um, we have four producers who are going to be putting out first product. Um, It'll be a smaller menu, but there's an unbelievable quality of product in Connecticut. And, um, you know, so, so those are some of the big the big changes that I think you'll see the difference of day one. And, you know, I hope that Connecticut continues to build a market that is they're really attempting to make it equitable up front. And so in Massachusetts, as was noted before, uh, equity diversely owned license didn't get open for like three or four years. And in Connecticut, uh, they're going to be diversely owned licenses opened, you know, maybe even within a month or two of the conversion from medical to hybrid. And that's something that I, think and hope the state should be incredibly proud of because other than New York, who just opened last week, no state's been able to note and accomplish that feat. And I know it's not perfect, but um, it really is a huge step in the right direction for this industry. And and how much buzz do you think is building? Are are you expecting long lines and traffic? Well, you've got me on the radio, so definitely some buzz. Um, (laughs) You know, we've been we've been getting a lot of press requests. Um, You know, Fine Fettle is I think we have an an outsized number of the facilities that are going to be open. From my understanding, about seven will be open on Tuesday, and we're we're three of them. So we think there's a lot of buzz. Our social media following has gone up by, I think, 40% over the last 25 days. Wow. We're getting a lot of hits on all of our newspapers. We've spent zero advertising dollars, candidly. And I think people are excited because this industry is going to create thousands of jobs. It's going to create a ton of tax revenue. It's, it's new. I think it's a long time coming, and I'm glad that the – state uh, legislature has put the Department of Consumer Te- Protection in the place to be able to operate and regulate this industry and do it in a really positive way. So, yeah, there's been a lot of buzz. We expect it to be busy, but we've been you know, preparing for how can we handle, you know, thousand some odd transactions a day per location. Right. And in regards to the, the rollout and the lottery, what improvements do you think are needed and how do you think the process can be more seamless? So we're trying to create uh, and we're trying to hit an intent with an imperfect situation, right? There is no perfect way of doing this because if you just give out license left, right, and center, the reality is you quickly get an oversaturated market. And then the lower capitalized groups are most likely the ones to fail. 
right? Because that is the one who is struggling to get going. And cannabis is an unbelievably capital intensive business and industry. A cultivation facility to do it legally and right can be three, four hundred dollars a square foot to build your grow. Dispensaries, million dollars. And you can't get a loan. This is not just available money from the bank. Um, and so I think I, I think one of the big things with the lottery would be is I would hope that there's you know a different level of um, requirements around how many applicants people can do in the social equity lottery and really reviewing those social equity applicants to ensure that there's a really good opportunity because, hey, if you do the math and someone puts in 2,000, I'll do the math for you, uh, <laughs> puts in 2,000 applications at 500 bucks a piece, that's $100,000. And if the income requirement is 135 thousand, I think was roughly what the number was or 153 or something like that. Um, you know, that's a lot of someone's net worth and that's pre-tax dollars on a, on an annual revenue to get there. And so I would hope that that is a legislative change, um, that could potentially come because I want social equity applicants to have a true and, you know, fair opportunity. I think in the general lottery, you know, the, the Powerball, I think is at $850 million this next week. And, People can put in and have the opportunity for that. But uh, on the social equity side, I think I would love to see that. And I hope the legislation does that. And I hope the Social Equity Council um, presents that to the legislature as a potential change, because I think that that would be for the good of the diversity of this industry. But I think in the way that it was set up, I'm, I'm impressed with how quickly Connecticut has gotten these new licenses going. And I, I believe the lottery was done in a way that is as fair as possible. And then you learn over time and adjustments are hopefully made. And that's what government is there to do. Gotcha. And Benjamin, how long have you been in, in the industry, in the cannabis industry? Sure. So Fine Federal applied in Connecticut in the competitive RFP in 2018. So we put in an application. I think it was April 21st, 2018. We won uh, in our Will Amantic location on December 19th of 20. Night of 2018, sorry. And then we opened our first doors in June of 2020, uh, sorry, in June of 2019. So we've been operating now for three and a half years. I was in all, all of our facilities the other day with 50 people per location. And I remember the day that we were writing our SOPs in our office um, two months before. So in three and a half years, we've you know, gone from one employee to 250 across the, the country. And um, it's pretty surreal to see what we're doing. And as a Connecticut-based business, to have this opportunity to really have a large market presence in our team's home state of Connecticut and to do this at home, is it's really cool. And um, it really means a lot to us. And we hope it means a lot to the state that we're from. Right. And I was going to say, did you did you ever think that this would happen where we are, you know, you're looking at New York, you're looking at Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maryland, who, you know, New Jersey, who are taking steps towards decriminalizing and towards uh, opening up dispensaries? I mean, did you did you ever think that this would be happening or happening this quickly? I think that over time, you know, society's open. And so I, I do think that I expected it. You never know and understand how long I do, though, think the thing that we're sort of not talking about that might be the biggest deal in this entire process is the 43,000 some odd records that were just expunged last week um, through Governor Lamont as part of this, right? right? And so this is not just about, oh, look, hey, these seven or nine stores can start selling legal marijuana. This is about the ch societal change about a plant. This is about 43,000 people whose lives were just changed and all of the people who are loved and around them that give them more opportunities that might let them vote if they had a felony that might, um, you know, give them more job access and opportunities that are going to give taxes back into the communities that have been most affected by the war on drugs. And so while, yes, I, I thought this would happen, I didn't know when to see it actually happen and make a difference is, is a really big deal. I know the press gets on, you know, Hey, sales are starting. But this other stuff is just as important and and honestly more. Yeah. And we'll revisit that in just one moment. But Jeffrey, you applied for the lottery. How did this unfold for you? Very challenging uh, for a social equity applicant like myself. Too many hurdles, uh, not enough clarification. Not I don't I don't see it being fair because, again, like people were allowed to do many multiple applications. Right. So a person like myself, like the other gentleman just said, that puts in one application for each app, you know, for each licenses have no kind of chance to it. Right. 
even though you know i got to i got to take it all with, with a grain of salt right i i see the most beautiful thing that's happening a lot of people have have come into this industry in the last year two four years from what i'm understanding myself i've been involved with the cannabis business since 2012 i'm a 2014 alumni from Oxterdam University the first and longest running cannabis university in the United States we wouldn't even be having this conversation on this radio talk show or anywhere in the country if it wasn't for the activists and the founders of my school that pushed proposition 215 and SB 420 if we're all aware of that um it's it's i've been an ambassador i've been telling everyone for the last decade right this is going to happen this is going to happen um and long and behold i was here at the time because i've been in california and oregon and washington growing right with my other friends that that i've learned my craft from you know prior to to going to oxterdam and learning the first fundamentals of cannabis but i don't see it it's it's very challenging for a social equity applicant um getting blindsided by certain issues uh if you don't if you're not really from uh computer literate you're going to have to get somebody to do this it's very challenging downloading 15 to 25 affidavits make sure that they're all notarized and into this computer along with all your other paperwork right um everybody was under the impression we are talking about the disproportionately impacted area ladies and gentlemen this is formally known as the minority drug zone which is a little bit harsh so that's why they changed the name this area is comprised of percentages of conviction rates right that's what makes you a social equity applicant you have to come from this area you have to live your first 9 years of the 18 years of your life or 5 years of the last 10 years in one of these areas to become a social equity applicant um seeing how everything played out um I don't want to sit here and point fingers. I want to say I want to be one of the first to say I'm going to be making cho- um meetings with legislator. We're going to have to change it to make it true social equity because we all know that this was not true social equity um that occurred here, you know, um but with everything moving forward, we can make it better. Right. And that's what that's what we want to do. We want to we want to be able to make it better this time. And and so what will you do for I guess the next year or so or next few months until you can apply for the lottery again? Well, with anticipation of all the trials and tribulations that I went through and I started seeing this in around maybe I want to say June when when they had the ex uh the ex um the expo the cannabis expo in Mohegan Sun. Um I seen that so we I had first had things shifted knowing that we didn't have a chance right putting in one application knowing that we have I have the skill set to do consulting we opened up Morero Consulting LLC and being able to connect with all of the other social equity applicants that did get the license and other people operators in order to help them because everyone if you're not a multi-state operator um and you're just coming into this you're going to need a team and if you don't have your team set up with cultivators processors I mean there's so many facets in in building up a dispensary security systems and all of that you're not you're going to fail it's it's a fact I mean everyone knows this from California to Oregon I have people that got 2.5 million dollar facilities in Oregon they've been in the red for the last 5 years so like he said before this is not a a a like-minded uh industry if you don't have the funding I mean you know I went to the cannabis chambers of commerce at the Hartford in um in Hartford and we talked about this you know a lot of the 149 operators were there and social equities and i i did you know i i you know straight forward got the mic they gave me the microphone and i asked Andrea Cohen that was the president of, of Department of Consumer Protection at the time when will we be allowed to apply again because you know i felt it was it it wasn't that much fair but we needed to know when we were going to apply so it was like until then that we can apply we're going to be giving consulting to everyone i mean medical patients are allowed to grow cannabis in their homes right um sooner or later people will be able to grow in mm. their homes 
And you're going to need adequate people like myself at Marrero Consulting to teach them the right way. Gotcha. I mean, there's there's a lot of things that could go left really quick. And that's what we want to offer people until we could apply again. That's yeah. what we're going to be applying ourselves to right now is okay. our consulting company and, and offer those services to everyone in general that, you know, there's 50, what is it? 55, uh, 55, 60,000 medical patients registered now. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we're just going to stay focused on, again, a lot of people are, are pointing fingers saying this was wrong. That was wrong. We don't want to do that. We want to say, what can we do to make it better this time? Okay. And like the gentleman said before, we will, we will be sitting down with our legislators and getting this, you know, getting this to become true social equity. What, it's not going to be allowed to have people put thousands of applications in against of social equity. Okay. You know? and, and again, we want to know, like, again, this is a good question that should be asked to all the companies and, and social equity, which I did at the, you know, I invited all social equity to come to the expo. You know, there was 38,000 licenses. I invited the whole social equity body to come those two days. Yeah. 15 people showed up the first day, three the next day. So yeah. the numbers don't add up, and we all know this. Yeah. So, you know, let's make it better. Let's make it more true social equity. Let's give people like myself that did go through the war on drugs, that I am a gun violence victim, that I did live the drug wars in, in my in my disproportionately impacted area, in my beautiful city, Stanford, Connecticut, the city that works. Right. Well, thank you so much to Skylar, Jeffrey, uh, and uh, and uh, Benjamin so much for your perspective. Um, we're going to head to break, uh, wrap up this segment. But again, thank you so much for your perspective. From Connecticut Public Radio, this is where we live. I'm Walter Smith Randolph. We'll be right back. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Walter Smith Randolph. This hour, we're talking about recreational marijuana sales here in Connecticut. Joining us now is Commissioner Michelle Siegel from the Department of Consumer Protection. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So tomorrow is the big day. What are recreational sales going to look like here in Connecticut? Well, it, in some way, time will tell, but I expect there is. it's getting a lot of attention. This is a product in a market people have been very excited about for quite some time. So I expect there'll be a lot of excitement, uh, probably uh, decent sized crowds and traffic around the businesses that are opening up. Uh, but I'm hoping for a smooth opening. And I think we have, you know, a number of businesses they have been planning for quite some time. We certainly did not sneak the state up on any anyone. So the towns, the businesses, they've all had time to prepare and for the potential traffic, the lines, uh, the large number of customers coming in. And so I think our businesses have been hiring up and others are getting ready for this opening day. Right. And for our listeners that don't know, can you talk a little bit about how uh, medicinal medicinal dispensaries are becoming hybrid dispensaries? What does that look like? So there was a process and it involved, a, you know, they, they paid an extra fee and then they had to provide a number of documents to us to demonstrate that they were ready to do adult sales, but also that they were gonna be respectful of the patients and that they had a, a plan in place to preserve the medical market. And we evaluated those plans. We didn't tell people exactly how they had to go about doing that, but we um, asked everybody before they could be approved to enter the adult use market to present to us their plan for how they're gonna ensure that patients are not being left out. So it, whether it's through separate lines, separate entrances, um, different ways of doing that. And so that was a, a really big piece of it. Right. And have you been in contact with, you know, neighboring states like uh, Massachusetts to kind of learn from them about adult, adult use and what that might look like? Absolutely. So we have, and, and state regulators, we all talk to each other all the time. And so we are part of groups that uh, communicate regularly on these issues. So we've definitely talked to other states. There's every every market has its own uniqueness. Massachusetts had uh, some probably bigger challenges. I believe they only opened with two locations. So that's for a bigger state with fewer locations. They were also really the first in this region to open for adult use. So they had a much larger sort of, I think, appeal to people maybe outside the state. So I expect things won't be quite as hectic in Connecticut between having more locations uh, and, and not being as novel of of an industry in the region. 
Right. And, and do you have any concerns as the commissioner? Do you have any concerns about adult use? Well, it's certainly something, and we regulate a lot of markets. It's meant for adults. And so we expect our businesses to be responsible and we expect consumers to be responsible. So you always have that risk or concern that people won't uh, take the responsibilities um, as seriously as they, maybe they need to and it will the product will get into the wrong hands. But we also regulate the liquor industry. We regulate the uh we regulate gambling in the state. And so there's a lot of, it's a tough balance and policymakers have to make as to how much do you want to allow adults who are 21 and over to participate in certain activities, recognizing that um, it's not a great marketplace and it's one that's not appropriate for people who are younger. Yeah. And, and, and you know, what exactly is the state doing to make sure that this doesn't get into the hand of, of minors? So there, there's a number of things. You know, one of the things that we've really required and so of our businesses is that they need to um, put these products. It needs to be in child proof packaging. So similar to, you know, other medications you get. And that's what we had in our medical market and have carried over to the adult use market. The packaging, we've had some strict requirements. What we don't want and where you sometimes get into the issues with inadvertent use by really young kids. We don't want these products to look like uh, foods that are not containing THC. So the packaging has to be uh, fairly plain. It has to clearly indicate that it's a THC product. Also the products themselves. So, you know, there's been controversy about things like uh, gummy bears or these candies in other states. And so we're not allowing, you can have the gummy material, but it can't be designed and colorful in a way where it's going to be mistaken for uh, children's food. So that's the big part of it. We've also been working with our sister agencies. So for example, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services to get information out there um, to remind people, hey, this is the safe way to store this product, safe way to use it. This is what you need to do to make sure it's uh, not going to be accessible to young people who may be in your house. Gotcha. Uh, you know, in our earlier segment, we heard a lot of concerns and criticism of the lottery program. Um, just your reaction to that, and do you think that we'll see any changes in the future in the lottery system? So certainly we're, we've heard that feedback as well. It It is built into the law, and I think with legislative session opening up, it, it's an opportunity for those conversations to happen. The reality is it's it's very tricky to design a program that appropriately takes social equity concerns into consideration. I think the legislature and a lot of people were involved, did a good job of putting social equity front and center in this bill, but definitely room for improvement. And I think as people saw how it played out and and how it operated, (laughs) excuse me, um, they're going to have, you know, more specific ways to offer input into that process. Right. Okay. You know, from my understanding, um, with the medical program, there was only a few people in DCP who were really assigned to oversee the program. But I understand now with adult use that there is sixty more than sixty people. Is that right? Did I get those numbers right? Um, yeah. Ultimately, we haven't fully hired up yet, but um, it will be much um, more fully funded. So the medical program. Um, The agency just didn't get a lot of resources to manage that program. And we have an incredible staff in our drug control division, our legal division, who's who's really done an amazing job. I think Connecticut had a fantastic medical program, and I expect us to continue to have a fantastic one. Um, But with adult use, this is a lot more people. You know, now we're talking everybody 21 and over. There's a lot more going to be a lot more businesses. So there's a lot of focus on the growers or cultivators and on the, the retailers or dispensaries. But there's nine different license types um, for the adult use market. So there's a lot of business opportunities for people who, who maybe don't want to grow the product or open a retail location. So you could, for example, maybe be a beverage, a food or beverage manufacturer if you if you want to be a bakery and you just want to get get the cannabis and you know make make your brownies or whatever and then sell them to a retailer. So there's a number of different business opportunities, but it does make it a much more complicated supply chain to regulate. And so it it was really important and it's good that the the state thought to fund this and staff us in a way where we can do that job appropriately. Right. And so everyone wants to know, when will the next lottery be? And also how many spots will there be? Do you know? 
We're still working on that, so I don't have an announcement today to make um, as to the, the precise details. And in part, we do want to um, allow some time for some of these conversations as to whether the process can improve. Right now, if we were to open a lottery today, it would be under the rules that, I've, as you said, have have received some criticism. Right. Gotcha. So need to change the rules and then uh, open it back up. Right. So I don't know exactly how long we're going to wait. We certainly know there's an interest in that, but you know, we haven't even quite opened the market yet. We do want to see how that plays out. We do have um, probably close to a hundred or more different businesses somewhere in the pipeline among these nine different um, categories of businesses who will be opening up. So a lot is going to be happening and we, we want to get a lay of the land. Okay. And I understand that you are leaving your position at DCP. Uh, what's next for you? Um, I'm, I'm still figuring some of that out. But yeah, so I plan to be here. Uh, I'm really proud of the work our agency did to get this cannabis market created and launched and done quickly. So I plan to be here a little longer to ensure a smooth transition uh, to see uh, you know, this market through its opening. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on Where We Live. Thank you. From Connecticut Public Radio, this is Where We Live. I'm Walter Smith Randolph. We'll be right back. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Walter Smith Randolph. This hour, we're talking about recreational marijuana sales in Connecticut, which start tomorrow. Joining me now is my partner in crime, Jim Hadadine, who is the data reporter and really jack of all trades for our investigative unit, the Accountability Project. Good morning, Jim. Good morning, Walter. Good to be across the booth from you here. Yes, and not on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jim, you recently reported on an investigation that found some dispensaries did not keep some of their promises back when they got licenses to sell medical marijuana. Tell me a little bit about that. So we um, did an investigation focused uh, not on the recreational side, but on the medical marijuana dispensaries that uh, have been up and running in Connecticut for a number of years now. Uh, The medical program was created in 2012, so it's been here for about a decade, and there have been three separate rounds of uh, licensing for the 18 dispensaries that are open in the state now. And so um, the reason, you know, we wanted to focus on these businesses is because they will be some of the first, the first movers into the recreational market, just the way that Connecticut set up its program. Uh, businesses, that, dispensaries that were already up and running selling medical marijuana uh, didn't have to go through the lottery process to convert into hybrid retailers. So some of these um, license holders will be some of the first to really benefit from Connecticut um, getting into recreational marijuana if they're approved by the state. So um, we decided to look at um, some of the commitments that these businesses made previously through the licensing process to give back to the community and try to evaluate um, the the degree to which they had satisfied those prior commitments. And and what did those commitments look like? So medical marijuana um, doesn't deliver some of the same um, tax revenue benefits to the state as the recreational program is expected to. Uh, medical marijuana is, um, you know, it's a it's a drug that people use for uh, palliative care of um, some really debilitating medical conditions, and so um, the state, instead of you know looking as, as at this as a profit center, asked some of the licensed applicants, "How are you going to give back to the community if you get these licenses?" And again, part of the origin there is that you know legalization of medical cannabis and recreational cannabis is um, addressing uh, long running uh, disparities in the community in terms of uh, the war on drugs policing and some of the communities that were harmed by um, uh, criminalization of marijuana in the past so each dispensary when it applied had to fill out a section that was called the community benefits plan that described their intentions to give money to charity to you know join the local chamber of commerce take other initiatives to kind of embed themselves in the community and be good neighbors so some of these things were um you know maybe giving money to um, AIDS Connecticut, which is a social service organization um, that provides you know a range of different um, supports for people who have an AIDS diagnosis. Um, we saw commitments to give money to the local police and fire departments, um, a range of other charities. And what happened when you called these places like the fire departments and AIDS Connecticut and said, hey, you know, this dispensary uh, said they were going to give you money. What did these folks say? Um, so we we had to kind of come up with our own framework to evaluate some of these commitments because what we discovered in the reporting process is um, it, it doesn't look to us like the state, the Department of Consumer Protection, 
um, had actually gone back to these businesses or kind of tried to, on its own, verify that they had done some of the things they were going to do. So we went through the 18 applications and made a list of all of the different organizations that we saw listed by name as specific intended beneficiaries of these community benefits plans. And we went ahead and called all of them. Uh, In the end, we had a list of more than 50 organizations. And what we found is that 35 of them told us they had no record of getting uh, the money or the other support that was described um, that was going to be coming their way. Uh, Nine of them either told us or we independently confirmed by other means that they did get some kind of support from the dispensaries and the remainder either didn't get back to us or couldn't couldn't comment one way or the other just because they have a policy around not disclosing who their donors are. But so in general, more than half of these commitments we found no record that they had been satisfied. And in many cases, the folks we talked to um, had no idea that the names of their organizations appeared in these dispensary license applications. I'll just uh, give one example very quickly. A woman that we talked to in Waterbury, um, Anita Pettengill is the founder of uh, the Make a Home Foundation. Her group uh, gives home furnishings, uh, beds, mm-hmm. mattresses, couches, everything you need uh, to get your home set up to people experiencing homelessness. And um, she's been doing that for a number of years with her husband. Um, you know, great program there. Uh, we talked to her. She was one of these people who said, I, I had no idea I was in line to get a donation from my foundation from a charity, um, from a dispensary. And um, after we did reach out to the new owner of that dispensary that had intended to give her support, they did make a donation um, to the Make a Home Foundation. But it was something that really kind of caught her blindside. And so she only got that money because you made a phone call. That's, I mean, uh, one can uh, one can infer that that's the case. Kind of came after we started uh, asking questions about this. Gotcha. And, and 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 this is easier math for me. So you called fifty places, and thirty five of them had no record of getting any type of donation that they were supposed to get. Yeah, and I do. I mean, it's a little tricky here because um, you know charities don't have to disclose who their donors right. are. So this isn't the type of thing where we can consult a public database and gotcha. see where it is. But the folks who were able to research it on our behalf and look at all the different kind of names of people associated with these these companies and the companies themselves told us they couldn't find evidence um, that they had gotten these donations. I do want to say, um, you know, the the kind of level of um, Uh, satisfying commitments is different for different businesses. And I want to mention in particular, um, I know Benjamin Zachs, who you were just speaking with from Fine Fettle. Um, I've had a few conversations with him, and I know he is very proud of the work that Fine Fettle has done um, fulfilling their community benefits plan. And and he feels going above and beyond the things that they had said that they were going to do when they first got up and running, Um, you know, adding some additional charities to the list based on uh, kind of the priorities of their employees in the community. Um, but one, you know, one of the issues that we saw coming up here is that uh, most of the businesses that got these dispensary licenses over the years have actually changed hands. So the folks who filled out these community benefits plans applied to the state and were approved for a dispensary license in most cases are now not the people who own these dispensaries. Mm. Um, there's been a lot of consolidation in the cannabis industry nationwide and in, and in Connecticut. Uh, The medical dispensaries are now owned by generally a kind of a handful of the largest cannabis companies in uh, the country. And it's kind of an open question what became of these community benefits plans when the licenses were acquired. So uh, you have circumstances where, you know, one ownership group got the license, um, sold it on for potentially a significant windfall. We've seen that the mergers and acquisitions have uh, been in the range of 10 to $20 million for each dispensary that was um, bought up along the way here. So you might have a group that, you know, in one case we saw a group that got a license, sold it before, uh, sold it on their opening day, so they never actually ran the dispensary themselves. That's potentially, we don't know the, the economics here, but that's potentially a profit or a windfall from that ownership group. And now the commitments that they had made in the community benefits plan, it's kind of a gray area what happened to that. Wait a minute, so you can you can get a license open it up and then you can sell it? You can sell the license or I guess you just sell your business. Uh, you sell the business and the license is, is part of that. But gotcha. there was, a there was um, particularly before recreational, um, over the years, there was a real premium on these medical licenses in Connecticut because Connecticut in particular had a very restricted licensing environment. Only 18 licenses in total granted now and obviously more people vying for them than that. So in Connecticut and other states like it, um, it's not uncommon for the the licenses that have been granted by the regulator to go for you know millions of dollars. Gotcha. Uh, and back to the donation. So 
so it seems like we have a double-edged sword here because some of the dispensaries, medical dispensaries, they changed hands. Maybe some bigger companies bought them. But then also the Department of Consumer Protection, which I understand did not want to comment on the story. They also only had two to three people overseeing the medical program. Is that right? Yeah, I think, I mean, um, one real big component of what we focused on in the story is who who was overseeing this industry and was there sufficient oversight for the entities that are involved? Um, you know, obviously, this is a newer industry in Connecticut. Um, at this point, uh, medical sales are in the range of $200 million. There's about 50,000 registered patients in the state. So it's not an insignificant, um, you know, amount of work for someone to keep tabs on on what's happening. And so we did, um, you know, we engaged with the Department of Consumer Protection. They, they did provide us information and records in response to our inquiries, but didn't make someone available to speak um, on the record for our story. But w- what we've learned from them is that, you know, over the years, their focus was really on um, prioritizing that the health and safety was um, closely, you know, monitored, that folks weren't uh, going to become ill from using these products, that this was a safe product. And... Um, as you just heard the commissioner describe, right. th- they had some limited resources over the years. They told us that on average, three to four state employees were kind of assigned to work on the medical program at a time. Um, they are now ramping that up. Um, they are in the process of filling 62 positions that are going to be assigned to recreational cannabis. But in general, there's kind of a broader question of how Connecticut has handled regulation for marijuana. Um, in other states, Massachusetts and Colorado, I know in particular, um, the state has established uh, an independent commission that is um, in charge of keeping track of this industry. Connecticut took a different path. Uh, they're handling this kind of in-house, essentially, giving it to the Department of Consumer Protection, one of these um, executive branch agencies, to handle the industry. And, um, you know, that's from talking to folks who were involved in, in how this uh, legislation was, was drafted, that was maybe a, a choice that was made to kind of expedite the process of getting adult use sales up and running. Uh, but it's, it kind of raises the question now of, is that sufficient for the state to really keep tabs on this industry? Right. We only got two minutes left here, Jim, but what's your big takeaway from, from this investigation? I, I think the big takeaway is, you know, as I was just saying, the, the industry here is one that is potentially lucrative for the businesses that are involved. And, um, you know, s- states states across the country are grappling with how do we ensure that, you know, allowing a uh, company's entry into this market is also going to benefit the communities that have been harmed uh, by uh, the war on drugs over the years. And so uh, I think as Connecticut is you know, analyzing its recreational program now, deciding whether it's um, got the right components in place to monitor the industry and ensure that um, the benefits are distributed equitably. Um, This is a time to kind of look at perhaps what other states are doing, um, what mechanisms they have built built in for oversight and enforcement, and whether, you know, the department itself is uh, kind of prepared to be at the forefront of this um, while it rolls out. And I, as, you, as you mentioned um, in your conversation with the commissioner, two of the important figures from the department are, are moving on yeah. to, uh, to other, uh, other avenues. So when we, when we heard the announcement about the, the rollout of recreational sales, the two people that you saw in that press conference were the commissioner who you talked to mm-hmm. and a deputy commissioner who has really helped guide the rollout of this program. Both those faces in a few months' time will be gone and we'll have new people um, you know, steering the ship at DCP. So I, I guess it's kind of a question of how much um, attention and focus is paid on this. Right. All right. Some big changes coming to DCP. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jim. Thank you, Walter. And thank you for listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Walter Smith Randolph. Today's show was produced by the fantastic Tess Terrible. Our technical director is the amazing Cat Pastor. You can download Where We Live anytime on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for listening.